Greetings and welcome to SK Speaks, a weekly podcast program brought to you by George Mason University School for Conflict Analysis and Resolution, also known as SK. My name is Carl Degrav Johnson, a PhD student at SK, and I'm here with Charlie Tart, and we are here to talk about the current state of affairs in Burma. Sure. Please welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Yeah. All right, so currently we've been hearing, or we've been reading about Burma in the news a lot. It's right. People are excited because the present regime is planning on opening up, as they say, opening up its borders and be more democratic. But what are the current sentiments about the promise of Burma? Well, the promise of Burma in terms of uh, what's on the ground uh, in the country, as opposed to what the international sentiments are, uh, there is that clear distinction, and there's also a clear distinction between you know, certain segments of uh, society in the country. Uh, what I mean by that is, you know, I would have to go back into Burma's history to kind of explain more about you know, how conflict uh, came about in Burma and uh, what some of the more and uh, most pertinent issues of the country are. Um, so basically, Burma used to be a British colony uh, from the late 1800s up until uh, 1947. Um, and during World War II, uh, how it gained it, its independence was through a, uh, a national hero. Uh, his name was uh, General Aung San. And what he essentially did was uh, when the Japanese first invaded the country, uh, he sided with the Japanese. And then he sided with the British in order to kick the Japanese out of the country. Uh, how he did that was uh, he united uh, various ethnic groups and uh, political uh, ideo- ideologues, uh, poli- political ideological groups uh, under you know, the the idea of Burmese independence. But more importantly, a uh, a f- federal union, a Burmese federal independence, uh, in that. You know, when the British took over, uh, Burma in it of, ins- of itself was um, composed of different uh, territories um, owned or uh, run by uh, various uh, ethnic uh, minorities or by the Burmese um, majority. Uh, so it was a, a mix match of, uh, of different uh, you know, tribes, uh, ethnicities, all in this one geographic location, like how uh, many uh, col- uh, colonial and po- post-colonial uh, situations are. So, uh, come after World War II, um, General Aung San uh, advocates for uh, the for independence of the country, and uh, he negotiates with the British. And uh, essentially, what the terms of the agreement are, are that, okay, um, uh, the British will uh, grant a Burma independence and that uh, as a federal union, uh, which was uh, stipulated through uh, a document called the, the Panglong Agreement, um, the various major ethnicities of the country, uh, meaning the Burmans, who, who compose uh, up to around 65 or 70 percent of the population, uh, the Kachin, the Mun, the Shan, uh, although the Karen weren't included in this original agreement, they did have a, a stake in it as well. Uh, but yes, the Karen uh, uh, ethnic groups, they all came together uh, to form this agreement that, uh, that delegated uh, f- responsibilities of the federal government as well as the responsibilities of the state and the rights of the states, which were typically uh, you know, predominantly uh, of composed of ethnic minorities. Unfortunately, in 1947, uh, shortly after uh, independence, uh, General Aung San was assassinated, and uh, who took over was a uh, general was a general called Um Nu. But the party uh, at the time, uh, it's called the uh, Anti-Fascist People's League, uh, and they had a bit of a, more of a uh, a social socialist or a left leaning uh, presence or ideology, but they weren't communist by any means. So you, know, you can think of like uh, Indian socialism, for example, um, and you know the the People's Congress uh, Party in India, for example. Um, so, anyways, 
Unu took over uh, from uh, General Aung San, and uh, he became prime minister. And uh, he was a little bit more uh, pro Burman and pro Buddhist than uh, Aung San. And at the same time, the country was uh, facing you know, what can only be described as you know a series of uh, long running uh, insurgencies that you know that came into place uh, that that I guess appeared. Um, so part of it was a communist insurgency um, and although the, the communists themselves were um, founding members of you know the independence movement uh, they wanted more Burma to look like more of a communist state and um, and a, an, insur an ethnic insurgency uh, as well and uh, what UNU did was he removed many of the uh, ethnic um, minority uh, leaders from government. So at up until that point, uh, and this was over a, a process of many years, from 47 onwards until uh, 62, um, up until that point, uh, there was what what can be described as you know a, a multi-ethnic government. And um, that trend was reversed so that the government, uh, members of the government, uh, became more and more um, Burman, uh, ethnic Burman. At the same time, um, you know, the, the rights of the states were uh, being diminished, uh, the country was facing insurgencies, even though uh, many urban areas were prospering uh, economically. Um, post-war, there were still all these, you know, political, ideological, and uh, ethnic, uh, salient ethnic issues that had to be dealt with, and um, and it wasn't, and it, it gave the opportunity for um, what we term as uh, you know, conflict spoilers to come about, and to um, to not only engage and, and exploit the conflict, but, you know, take it to uh, in the next levels of intensity, and um, how that came about was uh, Unu was facing a lot of uh, a, a no confidence vote and a lot of you know fight, fighting, infighting within the party. So um, in I think 1960, um, he temporarily handed over power to uh, General Ne Win, uh, who was the chief of staff of the army at the time, or, well, the chief of staff of the military uh, in general. And um, Ne Win was seen as more of a um, non-partisan figure, if you will. So at first, you know, he took over power, uh, but then, you know, handed back over uh, the reins of government to the civilian uh, authorities, uh, to the civilian, um, you know, parliaments. But in 1962, uh, he uh, implemented a coup and uh, uh, abolished uh, many of the institutions that were uh, in, in the democratic institutions that were in place up until that point. Uh, afterwards, Nguyen had a policy of um, the Burmese way to socialism, and it was really a, a weird, uh, eclectic mix of you know, some socialist ideology and. Uh, mostly his superstitions and some you know, ancient Burmese superstitions as well. And um, you know, he, they tried to run the economy and the, and the military uh, in that sort of fashion. So uh, a lot of the businesses were nationalized, and a lot of the industries were nationalized, and the country, although it was doing well, it just, the economic situation plummeted. and. Um, it, re it didn't really recover uh, from then onwards um, for for quite a long time. Um, so the country was essentially closed off uh, in in many aspects uh, right after the coup, and um, the and the conflicts against uh, the armed ethnic minority groups uh, because a lot of, a lot of these groups are. Uh, oh, in response to what we term as the structural violence of the majority, uh, from as early as 1949, 
uh, they armed themselves and you know they created their own alternative institutions of power and governance uh, in their own regions uh, like say for example the Karen and oftentimes uh, they either fought for uh, greater uh, federalism or outright independence um, so the campaigns against uh, these ethnic groups as well as the communists were were stepped up during this period and um, what they termed the four cuts uh, strategy which was basically you know, cutting off you know, the supplies, the information, the food and the, the people from um, the, the, what they termed as insurgent groups uh, of the country. So from 1962 60, until around uh, 87, 88, uh, this was the situation in the country. Um, around 88, um, what it, we essentially saw was you know, the, the country in absolute shambles, right? Uh, long-running insurgencies, um, a, a ruined economy, and on top of that, General Nguyen had a... Well, the thing about Burmese leaders is that they often rely on uh, fortune tellers to guide them in their policy making. So <laughs> General Nguyen had his fortune teller uh, tell him that it'll bring good luck and fortune if he um, changes the, the valuation of the cur currency from you know, denominations of you know, 10, like, like most currencies, mm -hmm. to de de denominations of 9. And they tried to reissue a new currency, but what they did was they voided you know, the, the old currency. So it pretty much made the entire you know, country insolvent. Um, everyone's savings were, were automatically wiped out. Uh, prices went through the roof. And there was you know, a, a real backlash against that. Um, even before, um, you know, there were intermittent protests, I think like one in 75. Um, and then several others before then, uh, mostly led by students, and um, uh, they were always, almost always, uh, cracked down on uh, very brutally. I mean, those were the days before internet or even TV in that country. So it was very easy to just uh, shoot down a couple hundred students here and there uh, if they start protesting. But when 88 came along, it wasn't just the students anymore. Um, it was, uh, large segments of the country were just so angry at what what was going on and at their uh, you know, current predicament. So the the military itself uh, formed a council and um, in essence you know, it was composed of many of the senior leaders, uh, senior generals of, of the military and they forced uh, Nguyen to step down and he did but you know, Nguyen still controlled the, the scenes uh, and you know he still had many allies within this council itself um, and the council's name uh, well they didn't name it at first but what they came to be known as uh, their initial name was uh, a very evil sounding SLORC uh, S-L-O-R-C uh, the State Law and Order uh, Restoration Council and um, uh, there was several changes in leadership uh, in, the, in this council because ev in essence everyone was vying for p power um, with you know, Nguyen uh, having been officially you know, retired and, um, and they did what uh, their name entailed which was they tried to uh, restore law and order by shooting down you know, thousands of people in the streets of you know, Rangoon or Mandalay or um, you know, other smaller cities in and around the country. Um, so what you have to realize is that the democracy movement in Burma uh, is interrelated to but not part of the uh, the struggle for uh, ethnic minority rights in the country. And uh, you know, there is kind of like this overlap between you know the, the goals of uh, the democracy movement, which is, um, which is still predominantly, but I, I wouldn't say predominantly, but uh, m mostly uh, you know, Burman in nature, 
and uh, the various uh, ethnic minority uh, groups uh, that that are fit, fighting against the government. Um, so once that happened, um, many of the student leaders um, you know, either went into exile or you know formed their own uh, rebel groups. Uh, so the the democracy movement was um, kind of like the figurehead of the democracy movement. Uh, the figurehead organization of the democracy movement was the National League for Democracy, uh, Aung San Suu Kyi's party. And there's a whole history, uh, complicated history behind that, but um, I'll try not to get into that. Um, the NLD uh, you know, kind of represented this new uh, line of thinking that you know there can be change in this country and that there can be democracy and there can be uh, freedoms uh, in this country that we have they have not in people of Burma have not enjoyed for so long and um, Aung San Suu Kyi uh, came to the forefront of this organization because she was the daughter of you know the great national hero uh, she is the daughter of the, the great national hero uh, General Aung San and you know, she represented just that hope that people were aspiring for, and uh, you know she, ha of course, you know she had her own uh, charisma. Uh, you know she was incredibly intelligent, uh, you know, fluent, uh, had a very posh British accent, but also you know fluent in Burmese and and so on. So you know she had a, a very wide appeal, even among, um, you know, uh, I would say, especially as well uh, with. Know, ethnic minority groups uh, that were also uh, having their own struggle against the the central government for for decades at this point. So uh, after eighty eight, after August eighth, nineteen eighty eight, uh, which was when the the massacres really took place in earnest, um, uh, there was a very tense calm in the country. Uh, there were still struggles going on. Uh, there were still protests uh, occasionally, and um, the the military uh, junta uh, decided to uh, give certain uh, rights, I suppose, and said, you know, as a compromise, they'll hold an election in ninety one, and uh, was it ninety or ninety one? Um, so, anyways. Um, so they decided to hold elections in uh, 91 and um, obviously the National League for Democracy uh, won by a, a landslide but they weren't allowed to uh, uh, take over power and there were a lot of political issues behind this as well uh, the NLD um, you know, gave the indication that uh, they would you know, completely purge the military and you know, the the military uh, leadership uh, were were unwilling to let that happen just from their own self interest and uh, you know it was just a very tense and hostile environment so the elections didn't really happen um, you know in the spirit of true uh, of good faith uh, and you know in spite of you know, the NLD winning uh, the the military did not hand over power and. Uh, Crack down on the many members of the NLD, um, but at the same time they also tried to uh, start opening up the country, uh, just in terms of you know, rolling back um, the a lot of the socialist policies that you know, they had from the Nguyen era, and there were also internal struggles within uh, the the ruling council as well. Uh, there was a at first, a, a general called uh, Saw Mang, and he um, he was forced to retire, and uh, there wasn't any real uh, clear leadership until uh, one general eventually emerged, uh, and his name is uh, Than Shui, uh, or as in pronounced in Burmese, Than Shui, um, and he uh, came to the forefront of uh, of the council, starting officially starting, I think, in uh, 93. So as the situation was evolving in Burma, uh, the military was kept getting stronger. Uh, they were winning many of the battles uh, against uh, uh, the ethnic minority groups. Um, at the same time, 
they also realized that they couldn't fight all the battles at once. So they started uh, a, <coughs> a system or a program of you know, having of either having the groups themselves split up, uh, like fomenting dissent within uh, the ethnic minority, armed ethnic minority groups, or um, you know, having signing ceasefire deals with them so they were allowed to keep their territory, their armies, but you know, there would be some form of, of peace, well, of non-violence at least, uh, for the time being. So uh, groups like the Kachin signed off on the ceasefire. Uh, other groups like the Karen, uh, they, uh, they splintered. Uh, because what you have to realize is many of these ethnic groups aren't entirely homogenous uh, either. Um, they uh, are often composed of, of various uh, ideological uh, you know, members, uh, you know, ethnic uh, divisions, uh, you know, ethnic cities within ethnic cities, uh, language, uh, religion. So in groups like the Karen, um, the, the Buddhist um, factions uh, split off from the, the Christian or the Karen are predominantly Christian peoples. Um, so there was a lot of tension within uh, the groups themselves um, and the organizations that, you know, that claim to represent these ethnic minorities. So the, the main Karen um, <clears throat> ethnic organization, uh, the KNU, the Karen uh, National Union, and the KNLA, the armed wing, the Karen National Liberation Army, they continue their struggle. Uh, but the DKBA, the uh, Democratic Karen Buddhist Army, uh, they signed a ceasefire deal with the government. Um, also, groups like the Shan, uh, which is also another uh, ethnic minority, um, they signed uh, ceasefire deals with the government, uh, although there was always intermittent fighting. Um, and then uh, they also splintered into you know, several groups as well. Uh, one of them, well, essentially, the, the Shan came from um, well, they had their own uh, independence movement, but they were heavily uh, interlinked to the communist um, movement starting from the 1940s. Uh, the communists were defeated in the late 1980s, and then uh, sort of the, the Shan nationalist uh, sentiments uh, evolved uh, further from that defeat. And um, you know, they also splintered into different factions um, with you know, certain groups uh, you know, being heavily involved in uh, the narcotics trade, uh, in heroin, opium, uh, methamphetamines, all that, um, you know, arms, the arms trade uh, in the triangle, the, the golden triangle. So it, it's, it became a very uh, complicated area to work in and you know, there were different factions fighting each other, different factions fighting against the government. Um, and throughout all this time, you know, the civilians in the area were obviously you know, caught in the middle of all this happening. Um, so this happened all throughout the 1990s or so, late 1980s to 1990s. And um, the while at the same time the d democracy movement was still uh, surviving, uh, if not flourishing, um, you know, it was mostly kept underground and um, members of the leaders of the democracy mo movement were still subject to you know, horrendous treatment and many of them went into exile but you know, it, it was still going on and you know, come late uh, 1990s to early 2000s uh, you know, the government kept opening up the economy uh, more and more but it didn't. It wasn't a, a real earnest uh, opening up because uh, corruption was still extremely rampant. Uh, so it became a uh, just an extremely dysfunctional uh, kleptocracy within uh, you know all in, all the institutions of government, um, and you know, they had their own cronies in the business sector. So basically, it just became a mess up until up until even now. But 
there were also the strategic concerns as well. Uh, Burma is a country uh, rich in national, uh, natural resources, uh, and um, neighboring countries such as China, Thailand, even India uh, had an increasing uh, interest in the in, in the resources of the country, right? And uh, you know they began to exploit the resources more and more, uh, everything from precious gems to uh, to oil and um, <coughs> and the rivers, uh, hydroelectric power. Um, so the the leaders, uh, Than Shui, uh, in particular, uh, realized realized this uh, this asset, but at the same time. Uh, at least this is my personal opinion, they didn't want to be completely beholden to um, you know, <coughs> their foreign uh, you know, sponsors, if you will, because these were the countries that were buying you know, the resources from them. Uh, so China in particular, so they didn't really want to be beholden to uh, Chinese interests, although this was a uh, mutual, mutually beneficial relationship. But I guess it came to a point where um, the system was so dysfunctional and the, the leaders were so paranoid that um, they decided, okay, uh, there needs to be some sh a paradigm shift, if you will, uh, if, this, if they still want to have, enjoy the same benefits that they do, uh, that in the interest of uh, self-preservation, uh, what they're doing is not sustainable. Uh, like the military is not sustainable because uh, they're running themselves into the ground even though you know, they're getting money from you know, the natural resources that they're selling. And um, you know, the insurgencies were still going on. Uh, they had ceasefires with most of these insurgents group, insurgent groups. Um, but it wasn't like there wasn't any um, progress made on that front, if you will, in terms of you know <coughs> securing the the control of the country, and the pro democracy movement was still uh, around. I mean, Aung San Suu Kyi, uh, in spite of you know, numerous house arrests and uh, and even a, an attack on her uh, on herself in uh, two thousand and three, um, there was. The movement was still fairly strong. Uh, ma many thought that they would be completely irrelevant, but that appeared not to be the case. So, I think the real uh, impetus or the, the real tipping point um, started in, I, th I would say, in 2007 when they uh, moved the capital from uh, Yangon or Rangoon to uh, a small uh, <coughs> little village. Uh, Called Biemana, and which they renamed to uh, Nepido, meaning um, you know, the land of kings or capital city, if you will. Um, so this happened in two thousand and seven, and at the time there were speculation speculations that you know, it happened again because of you know, a fortune teller t telling Than Shui that you should do this. But just as important was um, the. A new constitution, which a constitution which they drafted in two thousand and eight, uh, which actually tried, it still tried to uh, secure and cement the power of the military and the power of the central authority. But the constitution also, you know, gave certain um, benefits to uh, at least codified the de facto benefits of you know the different uh, ceasefire groups. Um, so they had their, they were granted, you know, in the in the in the constitution their own uh, autonomous territories and so on, and um, in two thousand and and eight uh, there was a a referendum on the constitution, and uh, you know, there was a huge hurricane or cyclone that happened during that time, and. But they, the government still uh, went ahead with it anyways, uh, instead of you know, dealing with the humanitarian crisis, and in many cases impeding the humanitarian uh, efforts. Um, and then uh, you know, there was widespread <coughs> allegations of, you know, of fraud and you know, mismanagement of this, 
referendum process because I mean you can't have a 99% turnout and a 99% approval of this you know, new constitution when no one has read it and you know 200,000 people just recently died from a cyclone. Mm. So this happened in 2008 and you know, there was a widespread uh, backlash of um, you know, of the government's handling of the situation. But it paved the way for, uh, again, what happened to be a sham, a sham uh, series of elections in 2010. But uh, what you also have to realize is that the, the, the inner circles of power are very murky. Like, you don't know uh, which generals are doing what. Uh, you don't know what their relationships are. Uh, Than Shui seemed to be at the top and seemed to be, you know, controlling things behind the, sh the scenes. But um, in a way, I think he sort of paved his way, because he was getting old, uh, he, he sort of paved his way for, uh, for him, himself to step down without f facing that many, or if any, uh, repercussions. Um, so they started handing over, you know, a lot of the civilian responsibilities to an official prime minister, um, and then uh, they were they, they handed it over to um, a gentleman. I think it was I forgot his name. I think it, yeah. To uh, uh, and they initially uh, handed it over to a, a prime minister who who was also a general and part of the, the council anyway. So it was just you know different a name change. Um, he died of cancer. So then. The power transferred from him to um, Feng Sing, uh, who who then became prime minister, but the the council itself was still in charge. Uh, by this point, they had renamed themselves to a friendlier name, uh, the SPDC or the uh, States uh, Development Council, uh, State Peace and Development Council. Um, so. By the time the elections came about, uh, the the SPDC was uh, in in the process of uh, dismantling itself, and by dismantling, it didn't mean that you know they're simply going to abolish themselves. Uh, the the senior generals um, you know tried to embed themselves into the different uh, government uh, civilian posts in the government, or they went back into the military, or they retired. Um, so you know, elections happened in 2010, uh, which were a sham, uh, and then the, the military-backed party, um, the USDA, the Union Sol Solidarity and Development Association, or, or Development Party, DP, um, they, they won through um, fraudulent means, and um, which wasn't that big of a deal anyways because the constitution uh, guarantees that the military assigns uh, at least 25 percent of the seats to uh, military officers so that's one of many uh, flawed parts of the constitutions but anyways um, so then surprisingly enough uh, the the earnestly um, Civilian government uh, came about um, through the leadership of uh, Feng Sein, and um, they started to actually you know, implement certain uh, dialogues and certain reforms in the country. Uh, they reached out a little more and more to the d democracy movement. Uh, they reached out more and more to the um, <coughs> the various uh, ethnic. Uh, Insurgent groups, uh, but there was still having uh, many issues within uh, uh, the, the seats of power and within um, within the <coughs> the government. Uh, so um, again, the the government itself um, and the senior leadership. And the the circles of leadership were in essence still kleptocracies, um, so 
Oh, they still had their their self interests and their um, you know, economic interests in mind, but they wanted to, uh, in a way, diversify. You know, th- the sources of power and income that they were receiving. So uh, there were a lot of issues uh, that came about because of that. Uh, one in particular was uh, well, there were two. Uh, one of them was. Um, and the <clears throat> issue of uh, power, hydropower, and uh, construction uh, in areas such as uh, in the Kachin region, and um, no, this wasn't the only uh, project that was going on. Uh, there were others, uh, you know, hydropower, uh, uh, refining, uh, industrial uh, centers, and all that um, that were, you know, being. <clears throat> planned in various uh, territories of of these uh, ethnic groups, and uh, you know there was a lot of you know, concern and backlash from not only from the ethnic groups and you know the armed ethnic opposition groups, but also from you know the local civilians, and you know there was a <clears throat> a rising uh, grassroots movements as well. And this also coincided with you know, the beginnings of dialogue and the opening up of you know, more freedoms, if you will, in the country and in 2010. Um, and you know, in reality, in, you know, beginning in 2011 as well. So then the second issue was uh, a lot of the ceasefire groups, uh, the military in- attempted to integrate them into are what they call the border guard forces. So, um, say a ceasefire group um, like the the Kachin, who were um, the Kachin Independence Army, who were a ceasefire group, um, ethnic armed opposition group along the Thai, not Thai, uh, along m- mostly the Chinese border, and uh, the DKBA, the Democratic Karen Buddhist Army, along the Thai border. Um, the government tried to force their hand and have them you know, integrate fully into the army. And uh, the groups rejected that, and then uh, fighting erupted all over again. In particular, um, the Kachin, uh, which fighting began in uh, 2010, uh, because mostly because of the dam issue and because of uh, you know, the border guard issue. and. And so f- fighting erupted again. They they scrapped the plan, but uh, because of this escalation, uh, the government also escalated their forces uh, in many of the border regions, many of the ethnic regions. Uh, although you know this only this only happened in you know, certain certain areas. Other areas, you know, they would still be trying to pursue uh, peace, peaceful or more peaceful alternatives. So. If anything, you know, the approach that they had was very uh, schizophrenic. Um, they tried to uh, you know, appease certain groups. Um, you know, they tried to increase engagement uh, at times, uh, especially with you know the the democratic uh, movement, especially with the NLD. So that's when you know you see a lot of the the, the big articles, you know, the the big headlines. Of you know Aung San Suu Kyi talking to the government, uh, you know in- increased engagement, you know greater freedoms, you know, you know more freedom of the press, you know, all these things that that should be required for a functioning, a more functioning democracy. So then, um, you know, come late two thousand and ten, late two thousand, well until about you know, late two thousand and eleven, you know, all. All these reforms came to a head, and they it, it started picking up very quickly, where you know, the Americans were involved. Uh, you know, Hillary Clinton's famous visit, uh, where um, the you know the Europeans, especially, uh, and also a lot of the regional actors were uh, increasingly increasingly involved in the country. So, um, so then. This also came at an ideal time because um, the government or you know, the the parliament at the time were uh, planning um, what's called by-elections because how how it's set up is that 
Now, if you're a member of parliament, you can't serve as a man member of the executive. So a lot of these, many of these uh, members were uh, being called into the executive branch. So a lot of these seats opened up and that created the situation for the NLD uh, to compete in elections, in, uh, which recently happened on uh, April 1st. So there was a, a lot of you know, a tit for tat, if you will, um, between the government and the NLD. You know, the NLD saying, you know, we accept these terms, you know, we'll register ourselves as the party, the government you know, uh, giving a, a give and take, if you will. Um, so then, uh, after a long series of negotiations and you know, a, a long campaign, a long election campaign, which was uh, very free, uh, the first time that you know, people, like hundreds of thousands of people, could be out in the streets openly, you know, expressing their views, and this happened just like you know, this started happening just six months ago, and it continues to this day. So, so that that started happening, and uh, it came to a head in in April, where um, you know, the NLD came to power. Oh, well, not came to power. NLD won uh, many of the seats, but there are only 40 seats or 45 seats in a 500-seat uh, you know, legislature, so it's not like they can be that effective, but it's the moral standing that they have within the country that, that, you know, that gives them the credibility and that can, you know, eventually have them integrated into some form of government uh, during the next cycle of elections, which is in 2015. So, yeah, uh, that's the situation as it is now. Uh, in terms of the, the strategic focus um, and, you know, the international uh, attention that's been given to it, what, uh, again, it's a, it's a carrot and stick, but uh, the international actors have their own interests in Burma as well. Uh, the Chinese have their uh, self-interests in terms of you know, getting the resources, uh, from the country, uh, and they want to see stability, some form of stability, uh, in the country. And they don't want their borders to be uh, constant, constant zones of conflict because that's not going to be good for business. The same thing with the ties, and even to, to the most extent with uh, the Indians. Um, you know, they have been increasingly uh, engaged uh, in in the economy of the country since you know, the early 2000s, but more so now, and that's picking up a lot uh, in terms of the regional players. Internationally, um, it's you know, the same thing, but also attached to it are you know, the, the aspects of political freedoms and human rights and you know, uh, you know, reversing the sanctions. Uh, so I think that the US foreign policy towards uh, Burma is, is sort of taking that approach. and. I actually think that uh, the Obama, Obama administration uh, uh, has a fairly, uh, you know, even-handed approach towards uh, Burma, uh, in that, you know, they're kind of having a wait and see policy, um, and if good things are coming out of it, you know, they'll reward it with good things. Still having the you know U.S. Uh, strategic interests in mind, no doubt, but you know, having things like reversing some of the sanctions. Um, so, uh, reversing the the travel bans on certain um, members of of the military, uh, you know, Hillary Clinton's visit, uh, increasing aid. So that's the other thing that's going to come about very in the very near future is that uh, Western countries, um, the U.S., uh, the Europeans, and well, you know, the Japanese as well, uh, they are going to start pumping a lot of aid into uh, Burma. Uh, depending on you know the the pace and shape of reforms that are taking place, but in essence, the outlook for the future is that um, in spite of all this happening, it's easily reversible and it's still extremely dysfunctional. So what you will see is a what will start out to be is really a very very flawed democracy with so many systemic problems that need to be. Uh, Tackled, and uh, that's not going to happen anytime soon. I mean, that needs to be, there needs to be a real effort locally uh, to do that, and and it's starting, but you know, it's new to everyone in the country.
and um, you know international aid and you know the whole buzzword and uh, international development aid is capacity building. You know that's gonna that's gonna be big in the country, but uh, it has to be earnest, and we don't know how that's going to shape out yet. And uh, so there has to be that uh, that local initiative, that local uh, intuition, and, and the local skills into rebuilding um, you know, the the institutions that have been corrupted for so long. So, like the economic institutions, uh, the the financial institutions, uh, you know, the reins of power, and you know, most importantly, the military itself. Like, I think that there are members of of the military uh, that are that have realized that. And um, but conflict is still ongoing, and it it's still extremely intense. Uh, it's just that again with this. Like I said, the the schizophrenic nature of the Burmese society is that, um, in spite of all these wonderful reforms that are going on in major cities, uh, in in the countryside or in parts of the country that people don't really talk about or care about much, um, like in the Kachin regions, uh, there's shelling on a daily basis. There are hundreds and thousands of uh, internally displaced peoples and refugees. Uh, even along um, the Karen regions, uh, you know, there are ceasefires in, that have you know, taken place very recently, and this is part of that whole you know reform initiative that's uh, you know that the government has in mind. Um, things along that border are still extremely tense, and uh, you know they can reverse and regress at any time, um, and. You know, the reforms, like I said, the reforms themselves can uh, regress at any time. So it's kind of, even for you know, Burmese, especially for Burmese people, it's it's a time of extreme hope. But you know, I think everyone has it in the back of their mind that you know, things can go still can still go horribly wrong. And I think the purpose of you know, what we're doing at SCAR or you know what we do at SCAR is to you know try to intervene uh, in those sorts of you know, ripe situations where you know positive change can be possible. Um, so that you did you mentioned SCAR just now and what are some of the things SCAR is doing or you think SCAR should do to help them move forward? Well, it's still in the very uh, nascent uh, stages, but um, I'm part of a working group called, well, it's an informal working group called the, the 3PF, the Three Pillar fam- Framework. And what we've done is um, Professor Dennis Sandoli here at SCAR, uh, he developed a m- model uh, a while ago, uh, and he's published several books on it, on how to build peace or trying to uh, assess a conflict and uh, come up with peace building intervention strategies for different uh, conflict situations and when I, I took his class uh, in fall 2011 and I was fairly Im- impressed by that model and, uh, and in applying it to uh, Burma and w- th- what that bo- model basically entailed was you know <clears throat> Assessing the the parties and what their goals, means, orientation is, and then you know assessing uh, the the underlying causes and conditions for conflict, and doing doing all this in a very uh, you know rational, uh, well thought out, logical model, and then uh, developing um, you know intervention strategies based on these assessments uh, with coordination of you know, the different. Uh, working parts like you know, different in- international in- institutions in mind. Um, so then I took that model and I wrote a very long paper about it on on Burma, and it kind of evolved into uh, over the pa- the course of the past few months. Uh, it uh, evolved into a uh, concept paper proposal uh, for USAID, and uh, what USAID is looking for is you no. Know, strategies and um, 
you know, models to guide them in uh, doing um, conflict mitigation and uh, in also in doing peace building and intervention work uh, around the world. And because um, Burma is a very hot topic on uh, on the radar, um, our group said, you know, we should do it because we have um, another alumni who who's an expert on Burma, much more knowledgeable than myself. I don't really consider myself an expert by any means. So uh, we all came together and wrote a proposal and uh, that's one of the initiatives. The other is, you know, we're still going to keep engaging uh, in uh, engaging with the local uh, institutions, local um, civil society in the country and, you know, <clears throat> getting uh, funding to do that from you know, international partners, uh, from no, or just going out into the field, uh, like myself, uh, and just you know assessing, seeing what the situation is like. Uh, so I'll be going shortly uh, as part of just my own initiative to uh, to see what it's like on the ground. Yeah. Well, that we like to thank you very much for your wonderful thank insights you very much, about Burma, and wish you all the luck with your USAID proposal as well as your trip. Thank you. And then we'd like to hear about the time you come back. Thank you, sir. Right.